It is 7.30. Mm -hmm. So at this time, we do have, I don't know exactly how many, well, I can count them up, but we have a lot of presentations. <coughs> you will have three to five minutes to come up and present. We'll go sit out there. Um, and then we'll just have quick questions and answers afterwards um, for anybody that wants to, you know, to say anything. Um, we've got to keep it tight, though, because <coughs> we do have a lot of people. Um, and the first one that's going to be up is the uh, McKenna's Blanche Ames. Siobhan McKenna, um, and I've been an Eastern resident for 23 years. I graduated from All Brains High School in 2015 and Stonehill College in 2019. I am currently working as a U.S. history teacher at North Attleboro High School. Um, the topic of my senior thesis was Blanche A. Ames, and through my research, I discovered her amazing contributions to the field of engineering, the fight for women, uh, women suffrage, and more personally for us, to the town of Eastern. I'm advocating for a new elementary school to be named after Blanche because of the powerful and positive impact of sharing her story with all of our youngest learners, but possibly mostly for our youngest girls. Her story intertwines with many other stories, those within our town's history, but also stories of our nation's history and the pioneer path she helped to form for women in STEM fields. Among her amazing, among many contributions, was the paradigm shift in public support of women's rights resulting in the right to vote for women, the engineering marvels that she invented. I would like to personally thank the individuals who have written letters of endorsement for the naming of the school, Catherine Honey, Kevin Friend, Paul Clifford, and Suzanne Bell. Why should you give Blanche a chance? I am proposing that by naming our school after Blanche, our little learners will be inspired by Blanche and other trailblazing women in the field of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Considering that it is the centennial anniversary of the 19th Amendment, what more beautiful way to honor our pioneers and suffragists than to name the school after Blanche? I believe we should recognize our town's history, and Blanche deserves this recognition for her own ingenuity. Lastly, I will address students' curiosity for uncovering the truth about history and learning about the women that have always been at the forefront of invention, but have not always had that recognition. The Massachusetts Board of Education addresses that in order to be successful citizens, students of Massachusetts have to be prepared with the skills in STEM fields. The best way to prepare our students for this is to give them early exposure to it. But how do we support an entire gender identity that feels um, that our society and our institutions have re reinforced that girls aren't interested in or don't belong in STEM fields. Well, we send an inclusive message and we educate them about a female inventor, engineer, architect that lived in our very own town, Blanche A. Ames. Blanche held four patents. She had members of the Pentagon visit Borderland Mansion to see her design to ensnare low flying enemy planes during World War II. She designed an eco-friendly toilet 
She was the master architect of Borderland Mansion. She was a mother of four, all while showing that women are inventors, creators, artists, technicians, and discoverers. She was a female in STEM, and she holds her roots in Easton. As someone who has lived in Easton my entire life, I take pride in my town's history. Some might feel that this is not the time to name another building after any of us, but we cannot deny the immense contributions the Ames family have provided the town of Easton. And specifically, Blanche's contributions have yet to be recognized. As a high schooler, I love the stories that started when I said I was from Olive Rains High School and not just Easton High School. Our schools open up a discussion about our town's history, and our town's history tells a story. It's a story that creates our identity, and I believe we have the opportunity to now create this new early elementary school's identity. By naming the school after Blanche, I believe we can support our little learners for an ever-changing world that's based on technology, AI, engineering, and science. It's time to celebrate women's contributions that have historically been unheard. We are in a movement of celebrating women that have been hidden. At the end of the day, Blanche wanted to give women a voice. She wanted to give them a role model to look to, one that excelled in STEM. She believed that women had the right to vote, to assert their intelligence, and to break gender barriers. This is powerful, and this is the power of an education. Thank you for your time, and please give Blanche a uh, questions? Okay. So next, we actually have two people presenting for the next name. Um, we have the Almedas and we have Hazel Morella. So, do the Almedas? Yes. Do you want to go first or do you want Hazel to go first? Alphabetical order. Okay. <laughs> <I'm first. laughs> Do you need the um, computer? No. Okay. I'm a little hard of hearing, so if you have any questions, you have to speak up. I thank you very much for having me. I'm a life member. My name, by the way, I'm sorry, is Don Almeida. We'll get that straight. I'm a life member of the Friends of Borderland, a life member of the Natural Resources Trust, and a member of the Friends of the Library. I'm also a homeowner in the Ames Historic District where my house was built in 1831 on Main Street next to Quisit Brook, which is now Langwater Pond. My maternal grandparents <clears throat> arrived in this country in 1899 then migrated to a bucolic Easton 106 years ago in 1914 to escape an urban setting with their firstborn, my mother, who became the oldest of 11 children. I was born in a house at 25 Center Street in North Easton, 79 years ago, within the shadow of the magnificent Ames Family Institutions of Learning, the first Oliver Ames High School, the Northeastern Grammar School, in the Ames Free Library. It was fairly common back then to be born in a house rather than a hospital, but not on a beautiful campus disguised as the center of a small town. My extended family, our friends, and everyone we knew in town had a wonderful story about Mrs. Frothingham, as she was called back then. Stories I could not, could not only, stories that I not only heard, but personally experienced as a growing child. <coughs> Stories that were always about children. And I include all of those townspeople who knew her, were touched by her, and have since passed away. Many of their names appear on our veterans' memorials. Some are inscribed at the town office building, and most are on monuments erected in our local cemeteries, which means none, none of these people can speak for her. If they knew I was speaking for them, I'm sure they would enthusiastically approve. As children, her benevolence and quiet humility contributed to our personal heritage and well-being. As adults, her name remains powerful and indelible. Let it always be said that her name should forever be remembered in association with the history of Easton's children 
and all future generations of children in this town. That remembrance in perpetuity could only be fitting by placing her name on a school where children learn. Every person who grew up in Easton since the early part of the 20th century, every person until their passing, was touched by her generous philanthropy because of her passion for children and for learning. Her annual Christmas party for all elementary schools was held in the auditorium at the first Oliver Ames High School where she and Santa Claus personally handed out wrapped presents to each and every child in town. She was also remembered for driving around in her electric car in the 1920s and 1930s, handing out nickels to poor but laughing children who greeted her as she drove through their neighborhoods. Back then, a nickel would buy a loaf of bread. This electric car story could have been lost and buried away if it wasn't for my late mother and late aunts and uncles, uncles who later went on to war and who would never forget her generosity. From her, they learned about kindness, hope, and giving during harsh times when families were struggling for years and Christmas was simply a date on a calendar without much joy and family gifts for children and when walking to church on a cold winter's day or night was the norm. Yet Mrs. Frothingham was their gift, far beyond a wrapped present under a tree. The Lewis A. Frothingham Memorial Park and the Frothingham Memorial Hall originally an adjunct gymnasium and basketball court, spawned many scholar athletes and housed the local Boy Scout group <coughs> for meetings in addition to other town activities. The park, as it was called, was the setting for observances on Memorial Day and Armistice Day, which is now Veterans Day. Her modesty would not allow her to attend these colorful ceremonies. I recall a small airplane flown from the Ames Airport, now Stonehill College, flew low and dropped a wreath to the officials and to the World War I and World War II veterans reverently standing below. Most of these veterans, some disabled, were once the town school children touched by Mrs. Frothingham and who now stood proudly at that park dedicated in her late husband's name. Their names now appear on our Veterans Memorial. As a child, I knew these people and are no, and who are no longer with us to speak on her behalf. And as a veteran, and one whose name is also on that memorial, I'm here to speak for them. It's now time to dedicate the passion of Mary Ames Frothingham's life in perpetuity by naming a school after her that teaches children. Thank you very much. because I would like to recommend The Guardian for Early Education Children in Easton for more than 40 years, Mary Ames Frothingham. I would really like to mention four things. The first is that in 1869, a building, a wooden building was constructed across from the rosary, across from the rockery. And there were 14 grades. Then, when Oliver Ames High School was built, that wooden building was dragged closer to Barrow Street, and it was still the elementary school. Mary Ames, she hadn't married Mr. Frothingham yet, went in about 1912, and she was horrified. It was not a 20th century educational place. She decided with her brothers, John and Lothrop, to build a 20th century school, the Northeastern Grammar. And that was done deliberately to compensate. The second, as mentioned, she felt that every 
child should have a Christmas gift. And therefore, what she did is decide, and she did this for more than 40 years, from about 1912, she died in 1955. She would decide on a truck, a new kind of truck, model truck, and every boy would get one. And for a girl, obviously a doll. Those would be bought in the summer, and she and her staff would hand wrap every one of those gifts for every student here in Easton, particularly elementary. As indicated, there would be a big party the last day of school before Christmas. There would be a magician, there would be ice cream, and then there would be the gift. But what about the outlying schools? Well, we came to Easton in 1945, and my dad's responsibility was to take all the gifts to the outlying schools with money to pay for the ice cream and cake. So every child, particularly, eventually it became K through three, received a special gift just before Christmas. That was important to her. Next, the park, as mentioned. It was obviously built to honor the Congress. <coughs> he was an outstanding athlete at Harvard. He was not only the captain of the senior baseball team, he was captain at the as a junior, which is extraordinary. <coughs> the focus was athletics. But what about her children? So. What was arranged was there's a separate ch se section for children. We all know it. There's a road in between. And as you picture it, the swings are not right beside that road. They're a distance away. No child is going to be hit by a bat or a ball. That was deliberately done by Mary Ames Frothingham that the children of Easton would have a place to play while their older brothers and sisters were playing baseball, whatever else. The last thing I want to mention is the Ames Free Library and a neighbor. The next time you go to the town office, that was Mrs. Frothingham's home, look to the left. See if you can see a medieval castle up on a hill. I won't ask you to put up your hand if you remember seeing it. That was built in 1895 for William Hadwin Ames. Mr. Ames was the oldest child of the governor, and he was a great industrialist. In 1915, his wife Mary died. And the next year, he marries a lady who's about half his age, Fanny Holt. And it was a wonderful relationship. Unfortunately, he died by 1918, less than two years. Fanny Holt Ames and Mary Ames Frothingham as neighbors became great friends. They used to walk their property together, talk about, obviously, the interests of the day, the children. Neither had a child, but children were important. And in 1928, the congressman died. Mrs. Frothingham is dealing with, obviously, the death. She's working on the pop, and she knows that soon she's going to be president of the Ames Free Library. Her brother Oliver is quite ill. And she had told Danny Holt Ames, I don't know how many times, that her one concern at the library was lack of effective children's services. There were two shelves, if you can picture, on the main floor at that time, the circulation desk. And just to the left were two shelves with children's books. They had boxes and boxes in the cellar, and what they do is rotate on the two shelves. 
the classics would be rotated among the schools. Mary H. Rothingham was determined that when she became president, that she would do something about this. And she shared that, obviously, with Fanny Moldings. One day, Fanny came to Mrs. Rothingham and said, I've got the solution to the children's problem. In a couple of years, she, Fanny Holtings, planned to move to Vermont with her sister. But she was determined before she left that she would do something in her husband's name, William Hadwin Ames. She would pay for a room to be added to the library. And she asked Mary Ames Frothingham, is that possible? And Mary said, well, there are legal things we have to look at in regard to the deed. There's a whole architectural thing. This is a Richardson building. And Mary indicated that she would pay for all of the expenses, she herself, not the library, to facilitate the children's room. So once all of the loopholes were taken care of, the children's room was built. And as you all know, it's named for William Hadwin Ames. Fanny did go to Vermont uh, before she left. She left two really um, sizable endowments to the library, which are still being used today. And she would come back every year for a special occasion. That room, William Hadwin Ames Children's Room, was very important to her. So, the effects today, in 2020, caused by Mrs. Frothingham, is first of all, the pop. And the new school is going to be relatively close to that. Obviously, they can use the facilities. And keep in mind that the park is 90 years old this year. And it's, other than CPA grants, all of the money has come out of the Frothingham Trust. It's something that we enjoy, be us children or what. The other, obviously, is the Fanny Hope Children's Room. <coughs> The children's room today is used for so many things you'd be amazed. And we're very fortunate because of the influence of Mary Ames Frothingham on the children of Easton. And I think that if you decide to honor <coughs> someone, it should be somebody who really was involved for decades in regard to the early education of children. Thank you for your listening. Mary Tarraka, you are next, <laughs> and you're an entourage. <laughs> are you going to use the computer?
So good evening, everyone. Um, thank you to the school committee for affording us the opportunity to speak tonight. We are here to honor Sarah L. Gallagher and to ask you for your consideration in naming the new elementary school after an educator who has had and continues to have an impact on education in Easton. It is our privilege to share our respect for Sarah with you all tonight. Sarah had an exemplary 35-year career in Easton as a student teacher, as a teacher, and then as a principal for 20 years. Her dedication to Easton began as an undergraduate at Stonehill College. Upon her graduation, she was immediately hired by Easton Public Schools and continued to be an unwavering proponent of the Easton Public School System for the remainder of her career. Why Sarah? She was a beloved female educator. Currently, we have six schools in Easton, none of which are named for an educator and none for a woman. We now have the opportunity to change that and to name the new building after this remarkable woman educator, Sarah Louise Gallagher. Sarah was highly respected. She was a calm, supportive, guiding light to students, families, and teachers always creating a warm, welcoming environment that fostered enthusiastic teaching and learning. Most important was Sarah's advocacy for children's rights. Everything was done with children's best interest as a priority. She was devoted to ensuring academic excellence entwined with caring child development. Sarah's influence is timeless. She personifies the current core values of the Eastern Public Schools. Safety and respect, communication and collaboration, leading by example, and continuous growth. I didn't have the honor to work in a building with Sarah's principal, but I consider myself so very fortunate to have worked with Sarah on the English Language Arts Committee. She was the co-chair of Stellar, some of you remember this. <laughs> um, for two years I worked with her to develop um, our English Language Act curriculum that came out in 1996. I'm not going to pass it around because I'm the only one still teaching. <laughs> um, she exemplified continuous growth, emphasizing that curriculum is a fluid document and a living document. I credit Sarah with my love of curriculum and for inspiring me to remain involved in the initiatives of the school system. Sarah was a model of integrity and respect for me and for so many other educators. She represents all of the Eastern educators, past, present, and future, many of whom are here tonight or have, ex or have expressed their support through letters and emails, which we have for you. Now we would like to share with you a short clip from Sarah's retirement party in April 1997. Former Superintendent Dr. Bill Simmons is speaking to a group of over 350 attendees. I promise to be kind and gentle. I have some additional thoughts to share on a more serious note. As I indicated earlier, this is by far the largest retirement turnout that I have seen, I think, since Donna Scotto's retirement dinner dance. People are here tonight because Sarah, during her 35 years as a teacher and an administrator in the Eastern Public Schools, has influenced in an immensely positive way the lives of thousands of children and adults. I'm sure there were many times, Sarah, during those 35 years that you wondered, am I doing the job well? Am I being the teacher, administrator, the children's advocate, the role model that you hope to be? And if your efforts were making the difference that you wanted in the lives of children for whom you're responsible. Well, the genuine care and thoughts expressed tonight, the turnout itself, the representation from so many different paths and walks of life, and the memories of tonight's tribute create a wonderful testimony to you that you will certainly recall each and every day of your life. Sarah chose to spend her career helping others. Her legacy is not only how well she did that, but the number of lives that she touched, shaped, and even changed through the example she set every one of those 35 years in Easton. The town of Easton and the Easton Public Schools will certainly miss you, Sarah. I will miss your involvement as a friend, 
as a supporter, as a confidant, and as a mentor. I wish you the very best. And as we've talked, as you move on to your next stage, whatever it will be, I'm sure will be in some way in a helping profession, and in some way you'll continue to touch new lives for many, many years to come. Thank you, sir. Please carefully consider naming the new elementary school to honor Sarah Gallagher, a dedicated woman who served our school system for 35 years with vigor and enthusiasm. Let us honor an unsung hero, a humble woman who rose to be both a direct influence on the lives of so many children and an inspiration to the working teachers who continue to silently and humbly invest their lives in our children and in our future. Although the school would have her name, her name represents all of us, all the members of the Eastern Public Schools community. Are we, sorry. One of the, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, we have a packet of additional information. I left it right in front of your spot, Nancy. Okay. For each member, for each of you, um, it's mainly a collection of letters and emails from supporters. We hope that you were able to find the time to look through them, and we thank you for your consideration. Tonight. Thank you. Very much. So Denise Pineda put in um, Susanna Ames Elementary, and I guess she couldn't be here tonight, and I don't have any other emails on that. Okay, next up is uh, Sharon Ateo. No, she's not here? Okay. She's at home. She's what? She just had surgery, so she can't oh. make it. Okay, I'll read her email in a minute, okay? I'll read her thing. Thank you, though. Um, <coughs> Is Bill Donahue here? Bill Donahue? No? Okay. Um, Nellie Brennan Hawk. Right here. Okay? Do you need a computer? No, I don't. Oh, okay. Yeah, first of all, um, excuse my voice, I'm just getting over a cold. Um, but I do first want to thank all of my presenters. It's been really interesting to hear about these different times of Eastern history, and I'm kind of taking this in a different direction in terms of historical representation. So, as you know, three of Eastern schools are named after people connected to the Ames family. Governor Oliver Ames, Frederick Law Olmsted, and H.H. H. Richardson. The latter two who were commissioned by the Ames family to produce public buildings and landscapes in an effort to clear the name of Oaks Ames who had been involved in a national scandal. Often in Easton, we focus on the 19th century heyday, which saw the Ames family and the Ames shovel shop as putting Easton on the map. How, and that's okay to celebrate that. <laughs> However, this celebration of wealthy white 19th century individuals has included a deeper history of Easton and its multicultural future. Therefore, I propose the name Metacomet Elementary School for our new school. For those of you who don't know, Metacomet was a great sachem or chief of the Wampanoag tribe. He is said to have been born in the Furnace Brook area of Easton in 1638. Long before Easton was incorporated as a town, Metacomet and his father, Massasoit, led a proud Wampanoag tribe, rich in culture and language. The Wampanoags cultivated this land, fished these lakes and rivers, and they conducted a sophisticated society in which women owned property and served as sachems themselves. European colonists began to expand into Wampanoag land, and their friendly relationship soon ended. The settlers began to take away the rights of the Native Americans. At this point, Metacomet led a valiant effort to unite several Native American tribes against expansion. <coughs> he used part of Easton as a headquarters for his troops. Disease and violence led to the deaths of most of the Wampanoags, and Metacomet was eventually captured and killed. However, I propose this name here because I think it's important to remember Easton's whole history. I want Easton's youngest children to know that there was a vibrant culture and language of proud and intelligent people 
who lived here and thrived here. I want the new name of our school to recognize the native heritage and the indigenous land on which we now live. I want to say to our students that there was once a great sachem who was born here and who lived here. If we say, as a school district and a community, that we value multiculturalism and all heritages, let's make this clear with the name of our new school. Thanks. Kevin White here. Come down. Good evening, everybody. I'll try, I, I can never make these things quick, but I'll try and make them entertaining so it feels a little quick. Um, You're on the clock. This process has been pretty amazing. I'm glad that the community has been involved. I've, I've been in the process of the design of this school, right? So when we brought the community in, it was fantastic to get all of that input. So I find this process to be pretty amazing too, that everybody's got these different perspectives. If you read online the, the conversations that are happening, you hear things like, eh, let's just call it Easton. Right? Easton Elementary, and you go, great. And I say to myself, yeah, maybe. But that's an opportunity that's lost. And we do have an opportunity here. Is it the biggest one in the world? Does the world collapse if we don't take the most of it? No. But we have an opportunity here, right? To do something with the name of this school. And this is, this is a generational opportunity, right? We probably are not going to spend another 90 million years, maybe long after some of us are gone or some of us have moved on, right? So we have an opportunity here to create something that's incredibly lasting. Now with that opportunity, we can have probably four different priorities of how are we going to name this thing? What's it going to do? And one priority is typical. You've seen it happen here. It's happened in every, and they're all great examples. Let's honor someone. There's, there should be someone so apparent that we should give the designation of their name to this school. And that should exist, and that should be there. So sometimes that's the priority. We have someone we must name this after. Sometimes it's, we must honor our history. And we've heard a lot about that. Amazing, amazing history we've heard from everyone, right? So let's honor the history of this town. Sometimes it's, let's just honor our own community. Who exists here now? What are we all about? What will we be about? Where can we go? Right, but to put our name, Easton, on that stamp. And so that's how we say, well, the community is our priority. But to me, there's a fourth priority. And it, I think is the most important of those. And that is the mission of this school. The mission of this school is simple. We are attempting to ignite in our kids, the youngest kids, the first time that they have to learn to ignite a passion around learning, a lifelong curiosity about learning. We are trying to ignite in them this feeling of, I love this school, I love exploring, I love innovating, I love questioning. And this is when you get them, right? Kindergarten, first grade, second grade. You get them after that, it might be even too late at that point to ignite that. So we have this opportunity and these four priorities. Okay? So I said to myself, if we were to name this, if we were to take the most advantage of this opportunity, we would do something that incorporates all four of those. That would be the sweet spot. Can something, can something truly encapsulate all four of those priorities? Now, quite honestly, and this is my opinion, but that's why I'm up here and giving this pitch, um, I personally think that the lowest priority is probably at this point, since nothing stands out, nothing is right in front of us, the honoring of someone as a priority, it's still there. We should speak to it. We should speak to people who came before. But I would put the mission as the highest, and then the town, the community, and our history and DNA as somewhere in the middle. So I think about that. I think about those four priorities. The people, the genesis, and <coughs> the spark, right? Who, cre who created the Big Bang? Who started this town? We've learned there was a culture long before us and everything that they ignited in a culture. And there was a second round of culture that came. And we have these prominent families like Ames and Frothingham. Each who gave their own boost, right? Each who gave something and left a legacy to give energy to this town, put us on the map. And those are some of the people that we think of when we think, let's honor those people. And then what about our town's history? I think about the old forge, right? I think about Foundry Street. I think about manufacturing. I think about the grit and the sweat. 
through World War II, and even currently now, that we build things, we make things here. Hammer to steel, right? We bang on it, and we do it until it's right. And that's, I think, an Eastern grit. I think it's like, that's in our DNA. And I like that about us. And I like that about the town. And it means something to us. I think if we were to speak to our community right now, what we think about this school has an opportunity to think, to, to, to coalesce everyone around this school. If you know the design, you know. There's a community aspect built into it. It's meant to have a community center. It's meant to be used not just as an elementary school, but to be built and used by the community itself to bring it together, to ignite conversation, celebration, debate, right? Competition, performance, whatever we do in that school as a community afterwards, that's something we want to celebrate. But we also want to put Easton back on the map. We want to proclaim our pride. We want to say Easton. And look at what we're producing here in Easton. Look at these kids from Easton. So I see that as an important part. But the mission is the most, to me, the most important. How do you make kids realize and understand the position they are in life of learning and what this means, of curiosity and what this means? How do you let the teachers who show up every day to know it is their mission to light something in these kids that make them go, I am going to be curious for the rest of my life. And to send them on a trajectory, to shoot them on a path of success. <coughs> the kids should be reminded every day when they walk in of that mission. The teachers should be reminded every day when they walk in of that mission. And the community should know every day, why did we spend this money on this school? What are we trying to do with it? So, what does all that? Right? What incorporates the, the, the history of the spark of the genesis, the Ames family, shovels. I think of the Transcontinental Railroad and, and, and shovel hitting rock across the entire country, right? And what happens when that, when that occurs? And, and the shovel works and the manufacturing, the foundry, the sparks and the building and all of this, right? I think of that history and of those people who created this and I think of a word. And I think of manufacturing. And I think of sweat and toil and grit and determination, and I think of a word. <coughs> and I think about what we're trying to do with the community, and not only right now, but not the past, what we're trying to do with the community and go forward with this building and how innovative it is. And then I think of the mission, right? And lighting a fire in these kids. And I think of one word. So, I'm going to so entirely be different here, this is not the name of a person, but this is a name that I think reclaims our community, name, speaks to the mission, talks to our past, and praises our community. It's very non-traditional, but I think it may work. So I would like to put forth the name Easton's Spark Elementary. If you can envision a spark flying as the diagonal in an A, in that spark. Call it the Ames A, call it whatever you'd like. The trajectory of a kid and his path on learning. This to me brings pride and joy. It explains itself in one word. A name should never just be, you have to sit and explain it for 10 minutes as to why it was named. <coughs> you should feel it. I know my, my, one of my daughters is a Parkview panda, and she loves being a panda day in and day out. The power of mascots are everything, and I could find nothing cooler than being eight and being a spark. I just think of all of these iconography that you can do and all the celebration that it has, and I'd love to let this building be something that ignites something in us. Thank you for this. Presenting? I didn't, presenting? Register. I, I didn't register, but I'd like to present. Okay, go ahead. Sure. <laughs> my name is Bill Ains. I'm not uh, going for one of my relatives, so I may not get invited next <laughs> week. <laughs> I, I think it's somewhat different, but I think it's all I do. 
Uh, for the name of the new school, I would like to suggest the Jim Craig School. Jim's impressive journey into American sports history while it began while he was playing hockey on the ponds in the woods off North Main Street. That continued as he progressed through the Eastern schools. As for some background, Jim and his family lived on North Main Street. His grandfather, Craig, emigrated from Nova Scotia and was a talented landscape artist. His dad worked in the shovel factories here and also had a passion for public service. He served on the Board of Health for 30 years and was on the school committee with my father during the construction of the Center Street School. Jim graduated from OA and went to Boston University. He made the Olympic team as the goalie for the 1980 games. In the final game against the heavily favored Russian team, the score was tied with five seconds left. In the legendary words of the announcer, Eurozoni Ur has the puck and there's five seconds left. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! Ruzioni scores! Jim was the goalie for that game, and it is forever referred to as the miracle on ice. In the dark days of the Cold War, when the Russians were regularly threatening us, a collection of college kids beat a team of Russian professionals. It is regarded as one of the greatest gold medal victories in America's Olympic history. On Saturday night, February 22nd, about a week or so from today, it will be the 40th, 40 years since that epic evening in Lake Placid. Sports teaches kids many life lessons <coughs> as they progress through their school days. They help children develop physical skills, get exercise, make friends, have fun, learn teamwork, learn to play fair, and improve, most of all, improve self-esteem. Children can dream of Olympic gold medals or just play on a team to have a fun time. Jim's story, and thus his name, are emblematic of a journey we all embark upon early in our lives. Thank you. So I'll read those to you. Nancy, yeah. I can, I can call. I would like to say a few words. Okay, go ahead. Okay, would you mind? Yep. Um, my name is Ed Lummish. Uh, I had the honor of going to Olive Williams High School, and I, my wife said, you've got to go up there and tell them your story. My, I'd like to speak in extemporaneously. Uh, uh, I, I had a stroke, so I'm not going to stand up. Um, on what the Ames family has meant to my family. Um, my parents came over here, the Jamalovichs, my mother and father came over here to Ellis Island to work at the, the Ames. My grandmother worked as a maid in the town office building. My grandfather worked making shovels in the shovel shop. My other parents from, came from Poland. Uh, they also came to Ellis Island. So when I grew up in the duplex house, that was sold to my grandparents who worked in the shovel shop pawn, one of the historic duplex houses, uh, for a minimum amount of money. What my grandfather made $14 a week, was that Hazel? Yeah, $14 a week. Uh, well, my grandparents grew up on one side, my mother and father, my two sisters, and I grew up on the other side. My cousins grew up in the other duplex, Sullivan's, and my second cousins, the Reeds grew up on the other side. And if it weren't for the Ames family, we'd, no, we'd not end up where we ended up today. Um, I don't have all the articulate words. I had them when I was younger. I don't have all the articulate words and uh, the really beautiful analogies to draw uh, for what happened. But what basically happened was is that my grandparents grew up. I went to Frothingham Park <coughs> and we had Frothingham Park, we had the, the hall that they talked about across the street from the, uh, the uh, old Oliver Ames, the original Oliver Ames High School. Those were all given by Minnie Frothingham. Minnie Frothingham lived two houses up from me in a single family home. She was head of the library. She didn't live upstairs like everybody thought she did. She had her own little house right up on Lincoln Street. And every morning during the summer I would go up there she was a librarian. I would go up to the, her house, and she would show me around the gods, what, the, what, weeds, what weeds looked like, and the pull those things. And then she worked at the library for the Ames family. And 
I learned that a boss is a proper name for a base. When I went home, I told my mom, Mom, you're calling that thing the wrong thing, it's a boss. And my mother looked look at me and she goes, well, okay. And, and I learned an awful lot. Minnie Frothingham was to eventually leave her property to my Aunt Nell, Helen Menick, up in New Hampshire, 28 acres. They had the iridescent moss on the farm. The only thing my Aunt Nell was worried about was getting the bond cover so the iridescent moss wouldn't disappear. Rather than put her money into the, the farmhouse, she didn't. My Aunt Nell was sent to uh, Simmons College in Boston by, the Ames, by Minnie Frothingham, the Ames family, as well as numerous other kids were sent to colleges. I can name it when I went to high school, higher tuitions paid and board and room paid for by the Ames family. How many scholarships they gave? John Sedell, Eddie Meehan, um, uh, just to name a couple. But I could name one from every class that got a scholarship. And some of those kids try to pay that money back to the Ames to give the scholarship back to the school so it could be relocated to someone else in the future. I learned great values growing up. We had Frothingham Park after I worked it for, uh, for Mary Lamprey. I was, she'd give me a nickel or a dime to go to the park. We played at the park all day, and I had to be home at 7 o'clock at night. My mother and father both worked. Minnie Frothingham came to our house, my grandparents' house. My mother told me the story. They parked the car that they used to like to ride around in, on, in up on the front lawn. And she came into the house and she sat down, had a cup of tea with my grandparents. She said, uh, Helen's going to have to leave the home and stay in a Boston. I'm going to put her up at a boarding school in there because she, when you come back, she comes back here, you don't always speak English in the house. And her English grade is down, but her other grades are up very well. She's doing very, very well. So my aunt now he rented her out a place to stay, a boarding house in Boston. And she came home once in a while on the trains to visit. She graduated with honor. My uncle Al, her brother, served in World War II, got the Navy Cross, came back here, worked for the town, voluntary fire department, was involved with the Ameses. Okay. Thank so, you. Thank you very uh, much. Uh, I'm not just saying. Okay. You know, you know, we We're have gentlemen, some people stand up, and I'm not trying to be discourteous, but they, what they do is they stand up and they don't understand what the Ames family meant. You know? Uh -huh. uh, they were just wonderful people. So is your nomination for Mary Ames Frothingham, for Blanche Ames? Or uh, Blanche Ames. Most of them, Ames. I don't remember that much about Blanche. I said I was not a historian of it. All I know what went on in my household <coughs> growing up as a kid right. okay. and what I saw. And I can't attest to every particular moment, et cetera, or how, how far the swings were from the witch car. I know I swang on the, uh, uh, you know, with the rings, we had the things and everything else in it. But what I'm saying to you is that we needed to have those things, and they always provided the facilities right. for it. Thank okay? you. Okay, and you know so, Nancy, because I you were here. I do know. Thank you very okay. much. Is coming up. Um, how do I make this work regular? You don't want me to help you? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I want to help you. How do I make it? I don't know. I don't do this. I don't have to do this anymore. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, and that's the clip. What do I do with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have Blanche A. Ames, Mary Ames, Frothingham, Sarah L. Gallio. I don't know anything. Um, did she? Denise? Denise, Denise. Hold on. <coughs> I think Denise just said Suzanne Haynes, and I didn't get anything else. Um, so this is from a sixth grader. <laughs> Center View Hall. Or some other movement of the three, you know, Center School, Mar Hall, Park View. So that was kind of cute. Um, this is Sharon, so let me um, just read her email. I would like to submit a name for consideration for the new elementary school. Unfortunately, she's unable to attend, so I should have known that. My strong preference for the new school would be to simply name it Easton Elementary School. 
The reason for this is because we, the entire town of Easton, came together as a community to work towards moving this vision of a new school forward. It wasn't a Northeastern or Southeastern decision. It wasn't a founding Ames decision. It wasn't an us versus them decision. It was one of Easton coming together as a community to do what's right for our future as a town. I understand other names have been tossed about for consideration, naming it after another Ames family member or after a former principal. Those are nice ideas, but honestly, that speaks to the past. This new school is the future. That's how it was designed. That, that's how it was marketed when looking for the town's people to vote for it. There are already plenty of Ames buildings in town. Let's let this new school represent the whole town in its entirety rather than naming it for an individual. Another solid reason to name the new school Easton Elementary School is to avoid hurting anyone's feelings. If you select one person's name over another, you have now alienated and hurt the supporters of any other name. It is we, the current taxpayers and residents of Easton, that will be paying for the school. I am Easton, my family is Easton, my neighbors are Easton. Naming the school Easton Elementary School is rightfully naming it for us. So I just want to thank Sharon and I hope you feel better. Okay. And I did also get some emails that were also on that same vein. Uh, Rob Gill, he wouldn't come in and present, he's out cleaning. Uh, the DJ Henry Elementary, and I think everybody knows about DJ, and, you know, as sad as that was. So, uh, met a comment we had. Easton Spark Elementary. Um, Lorna, okay. This is from Lorna Payon, who was a former teacher at the Richardson Olmstead building. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, let's see. I would like to suggest that the new elementary school contain the word United. Easton United, Easton United Elementary, or simply United would relay the intent that Santa Morrow and Parkview Elementary children will be genu genuinely welcomed and equally united under one roof. We are a nation politically divided, Republicans and de Democrats. We are a community geographically, ge geographically divided, sorry, north and south. We were an upper middle elementary school, too long divided, purple and green. My motivation for the name has evolved over time. I started teaching in 1969 and became a resident in 1975. Back then, there was one Easton. My husband and I appreciated the small town environment of Easton, and our children thrived in the Easton schools. We truly enjoy the community. Then something changed. As a resident, teacher, and parent within the town of Easton, I became acutely aware of the differences in zip codes within our town. When Richardson Olmsted opened, I was one of the original staff. The school was a modern, state-of-the-art building built for all the children of the town. But it was soon apparent that the children would be segregated within the walls of the school by color. As a teacher, I was painfully aware of the carefully planned separation of green and purple on playgrounds, in cafeteria seating, and of classroom placement simply because of zip codes. Now that my grandchildren are at RO, I am pleased to observe the children of Richardson Olmsted nonchalantly walking the green and purple tiles blissfully unaware of past color restrictions. My goal in adding United to the new school name may seem unnecessary, but the results are needed. The children of Center Morrow Parkview must unite as one student body instead of three. The families of both North and South must unite as one parent group instead of two or three. The tiles within the new building must display neutral unified colors for one and all. Easton United would represent more than a name for our school. It would represent a way of life for our community and children. A mindset of unity, inclusion, equality, a guarantee of belonging, and a respect for all sides. It would represent a united entity of one student body, one parent group, one neutral life. That's from Lorna Peo. Okay. And that's it. So, um, I will take some questions. Um, and then, we do have it on the agenda as a possible vote, although, I'm certainly overwhelmed by all the presentations, and thank you so much for, it was a great history lesson and a great wake-up call for all of us, I think. So does anybody have any questions? Jane. I have one. 
Yes. So, and this isn't related to any specific presentation, but I just wondered if the school committee, because I know you've talked about this a couple of times mm -hmm. at, at different meetings, if as a committee you've agreed to kind of, I don't know, like a set of criteria, uh, you know, what, when you, when you decide, is it just going to be, well, that's the name I like, or are you trying to achieve certain goals by picking a name? Well, I'll speak on my behalf and then others can chime in. Um, I believe, I, yes, huh? you can if you'd like, sure, I love having my girls up here. Um, the thing is, I think we were kind of waiting for tonight to see what would come out, and like I said, I, I don't know that we can vote tonight, because this, this was um, unbelievably overwhelming, this is great, and um, I would say, no, it's not just going to be like put them in a hat and pick one out. I think we have to discuss it at a, probably at an executive session meeting. Maybe, I don't know, but. No, no. Chime in, girls. You can't do executive no. session for that. No, we can discuss that at a meeting. Oh, we can discuss it at a meeting? We don't have to be in executive no. session. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that this was great. I've learned a lot tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a lot of information, and I know yeah. I would like some time to just kind of as I was listening to everybody, it's like, gee, could we just have like this giant billboard and just go right in order with all these people that are, everybody's deserving. I mean, there, there are people that didn't even come up tonight that are deserving also. So it's very hard to um, name a school for sure. And uh, I believe we had talked about this at a recent meeting that uh, Richardson Olmsted was a contest in the sixth grade. To, and somebody came up with those two because that's, you know, when they went on those walking tours, they knew about Richardson, they knew about the Rockery and Olmstead and all that. So we have so much history here in Easton. That's why we not we live here because of the history, but it's a beautiful town to be in. Well, and the only reason I said that, and it's not a perfect analogy, but it's like when you have to pick anything, if you have, you know, when you have to choose a principal or, or you know, usually come up with what are the things that we're looking for? What are we trying to achieve with this? And, and, I, and I think that would be part of our discussion when we sit down to kind of talk about all the presentations that we saw. Or, you know, <coughs> many of us have other ideas as well. That we can kind of talk about what we want the naming of the school to mean and what we want it to represent. Caroline. Well, I have a little bit of a different idea. I don't know if anyone here or everyone here has heard of ranked choice voting. <laughs> but that's actually a type of voting that is beginning to uh, take off in smaller communities across the country. But it's where people can list their choices in order. And so then if you have a split vote, say you had 2-2-1 two, two, or whatever, the one would drop off, but people give their first, second, and third choice. And so the, if, if one drops off, then the next one, the second choice votes move up. I, I, I'm not going to explain this very well, but I will bring you all the information about it. But it's actually a good way to, at least if you have a group of people voting, that everybody has some buy-in at the end, because it's almost always going to be at least the first or second choice of everyone in the group. Um, but I do agree we should wait to vote, and I also want to be able to read all of the letters and emails mm -hmm. that you know, we've been provided. And, and I have emails to share with you, too. So do we answer your question, Jane? Okay. I wasn't going to give her one, so I was going to keep two for myself. <laughs> any, are there any other questions? OK, Tim? How will you ultimately, what's the final vote? Who's we are the final vote, you, okay, the so five of us. All right, okay. Scary. No. <laughs> <laughs> Up in the back. Is there any past president, uh, any buildings in the town are near? <coughs> like what? how, you know, for example, Center School, how did it get named, but that kind of thing, Parkview? Any kind, yeah, I mean. I don't think there's well, a precedent. We know, well, we know what, we know how RO was named, right? Yeah. That was we know Richardson Olmstead was a contest. They picked the two, you know, the builder and the um, the, uh, the 
the architect and the landscape. The uh, landscaper. Um, all the rains, high school in, got named because... In terms because, of the bylaws and that, how, how a name is um, chosen, is there anything set uh, in the path? I don't know. I, I'll ask Tim in one second. Ian. But if it was a contest, <laughs> on the side, the say it again. Right. The school it committee. School committee. Mr. Brockman told me the school decided. committee assigned it. So the kids submitted in it. In sixth the grade. The committee ultimately made right. the decision. Yes. Oh, oh yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yes. Right here, Mr. Ames, you had your hand up. No, it was kind of a tongue in cheek thing, so I'll pass. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I yeah. Okay, Tim, do you have any idea on naming of buildings in town? A precedent? Yeah. No. no. Center school. school is a geographic center of town. That's why that's center school. It's right. Kind of, I guess it's obvious, but and park we was kind of close to the park. The park so right. We, right. Yeah, I guess it's obvious. Mar Hall was already named when we bought it. Right. So we had the history of the lack of the lack of history of the lack of creativity. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> but the other thing is too that we want to make a, a quick decision because Dr. Cabral said the better we, you know, as they get planning bills to be paid, things, if there's a name on the building, it just makes it easier all the way through. You can call it something, not, oh, the new school, or da 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 So, Carolyn? I was just going to say, the school committee also was responsible for naming the Eastern Middle School, and that was a discussion about, you know, a sort of logical, neutral thing. Mm -hmm. But the, I, I was actually on school committee for both Richardson and Oliver. Well, then it was Richardson School, Olmstead School, and then of course um, Eastern Middle School. It's always been in my 27 years of school committee decisions. And that went from Eastern Junior High to Eastern Middle School. There actually right. was an Eastern Changed Middle School on Lincoln Street at one time. Right, that's right. right. But okay. that was only 6th grade and 2 grade. There you go. <laughs> well, it, it, it's had its little things going around. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Levish? This is the last real naming of any building we have is any significance. In other words, we've had people who have worked in the school department who have done an outstanding job and usually we name something like this is the uh, name in honor of the superintendent of the schools who did an outstanding job for us. Um, we had that. But we've had other principals like we've had uh, Mrs. Gurney at the uh, mm -hmm. elementary school. Well, that's what, I was, yeah. that's what I was trying to say yeah. earlier. There's so many people. There's so many people that contribute. It's hard to do anything. One thing that stands out in mind is that We've neglected the Ames family because we, this one got named Oliver Ames High School, and then after that, nothing came up uh, to okay. continue to name something. So I think that since this is the last major thing, and you know, the library, the Oak Ames Hall, Frothingham Hall, you know, I don't know, uh, the town offices, those were all donated to the town by the Ames family. Right. In other right. words, we should recognize what they've done. Right. The number of kids they've sent to college and all those other things. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. st scholarship. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I appreciate all of you coming to give your input. This is great. Please stay. We have much more <laughs> on the agenda.